So uh, this is sort of a little bit of like a, a, a orientation to zipline, a little bit behind the scenes stuff to show. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to answering questions after and having some fun with that. So. Yes. Um, all right, so diving right in. So sort of zipline's origin story in two slides. We started five years ago. We didn't start with the technology. We started by, uh, we actually looked at a lot of different potential things to do. We wanted something that would scale and have impact. Uh, and uh, my co-founders and I both have family and friends in the public health space. And they said, go look at this problem of access to medical supplies. It's having a massive health impact. It's putting uh, vaccination campaigns stop in its tracks. Uh, and so we did that. Um, and, and in two photos, um, that's not the right sound. <laughs> in two photos, there's one photo. So this is uh, going to visit a health clinic in Tanzania. Um, and as you can imagine, being a doctor or, or a patient on the other side of that road uh, is a pretty shitty experience. Uh, and more often than not, they're don't, they don't have what they need to treat a patient. Um, OK, the second photo, this is a photo taken in a country that asked not to be named, because uh, this is a photo taken outside a medical supply warehouse. And this is a photo of expired medicine. Um, and, you know, there's obviously I'm glossing over lots of details, but we come at this from a very skeptical point of view. I, when I started looking at this, I was like, okay, we're going to look at this, we're going to figure out why we can't make a difference, and we're going to look at something else. Um, but really starting to understand that there was supply, uh, that there was an opportunity here to actually sort of connect the supply with these doctors. Uh, we could really make a huge impact as well how we got started. So fast forward five years. <laughs> Uh, we, we've been operating in Rwanda and now Ghana for the last three years. Uh, a few weeks ago, we just hit 2 million kilometers uh, doing actual operations. Um, we started delivering just blood, and we've delivered over 36,000 units of blood now. Now we do vaccines and other, and other medical supplies as well. Um, and uh, so I'll be talking about some of the things that we do to make this kind of tech work in the real world, and then some of the month we have a huge challenge ahead of us to scale, which I'll close with. So if you haven't been to Rwanda, it's gorgeous. I recommend going. The culture is amazing. Uh, and I like to play this clip because it ends on our distribution center, our first one. <laughs> uh, but it's a gorgeous place. Uh, it's fun for drone operations because there's not a flat spot in the whole country. It's all mountains. Um, and so welcome to the first distribution center of Zipline. This is version one uh, on the tent, and uh, version two there. Um, this is now Zipline Academy. This is where everybody, all of our operators in our flight side and our fulfillment side uh, get trained. So uh, we've done operations now um, with various exercises in California, in Australia, and in Ghana. Everybody goes here to get trained. Every month we have a class. Um, all good? OK. Um, yeah, so we, we have all of our inventory on, uh, in stock in site. So orders are filled on demand. Um, so an order comes in from a doctor by WhatsApp, by phone, by uh, uh, now other technologies. We pack it on site. It takes about five minutes from the time the order comes in, the order is in the air. Uh, and so as you just saw that the package was passed to the flight operator who puts it into the body of a, of a zip drone. We, sorry, we call our drone zips. <laughs> I often forget to tell people the, the definition. Uh, you put the body on, you pop on a wing, you pop in a battery. Um, here's a pre-flight process, uh, and then we launch the, the zip. Um, so. Uh, to kind of, uh, before I get into some of the stuff we do to sort of make this really work well, uh, just make sure you understand a little bit of the health piece that we're trying to make a difference around. Um, and we have now some interesting data around blood. So, um, so <laughs> I don't think that's me. Uh, so, you know, blood is, blood is of course, uh, very precious, right? There's never enough blood in the blood supply chain. And it's very expensive. Um, you wouldn't believe how expensive it is here, even though it's donated. The cost is actually very, very high. Uh, of course, there's many types of blood, some of which are very rare. So there's one metric that all governments track, and that's how much of their blood supply expires before it can be used by, by patients. Uh, and so in the Western countries, the numbers are high. There's, I, we actually have some data in the States showing this is actually even higher in rural areas, way higher than 20%. And this is massively expensive, and of course, Generally speaking, uh, when blood is expiring, there's someone else who could have used that blood somewhere else. Uh, and so in Rwanda, of these 36,000 units of blood, um, we've achieved a waste rate that's basically world at best in terms of being low. And this has a massive health impact. 
Uh, to understand the health impact, you have to understand maternal mortality. So maternal mortality, right, is how often a mother dies from complications due to childbirth. Biggest use of blood in the world. In Rwanda, 40% of all blood goes to this one use case. It's the biggest use of blood in the whole world. Um, and this, I, I show this before getting to the next section, just as sort of a reminder, well, we think about sort of three things. We, we obviously don't want to hit aircraft in the air. We don't want to hurt people on the ground. But for many of our orders, there are emergency orders where getting the order through is oftentimes statistically even more important than those other two. And so it's a very tricky sort of tension uh, within our company, as well as between our customer, the public health system of Rwanda, and the regulator, uh, who uh, between basically how often we land by parachutes or planes, if they can't fly in the storm, they land by parachutes. The regulators don't like that. Uh, but of course, with the more conservative we are, uh, the, the less we're getting deliveries through. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so in case you're picturing like African savanna uh, with giraffes and nobody, uh, I like to play this video. This is the second flight we ever did in Rwanda, but just it's to highlight, you know, this all mountains, lots of rivers, lots of weather. It's very near the equator, so the weather is very unpredictable and very localized. Um, anyway, so okay, don't picture flat uh, and don't picture clear skies. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we've done over the years to basically make operating in storms very, very reliable. So classic failure mode of aircraft, right? Hard landings. And so this is what we operate now to land our, our zips. And this is a system, this is not where we started, but where we ended to find a way to land a fixed aircraft uh, where you're either landing it gently. So this is a 4G, very gentle, predictable load on the aircraft, or the aircraft goes around and tries again. And in the gray area, it's like, better than five nines right now in operations. We've had, we've had one hard landing and 18,000 uh, operational uh, landings with, with the system. So uh, to be clear, I'm, if you're tracking our stats, 18,000, the system isn't what we started with, like I said. You know, we started with something very different. Um, anyway, so this is one example of just you know, trying to find something that really makes the operations easy. Uh, a lot of what we do is, again, how do we make the operators are able to focus on their safety, you know, the right product to the right doctor, not on the technology. And so we focus a lot on basically automating the corner cases. That's how we call it. So this is one of those corner cases. So if a zip is about to land and you hit the big red button next to the recovery system, uh, the zip will go and wait. In Rwanda today, we'll have as many as 16 zips in the air at once. So if you wait a few minutes, you'll see a, a queue like this. Um, and of course, you know, this uh, for the geeks in the room, which is probably most of you, this is uh, redundant, this is fault tolerant and distributed. So no master in this kind of behavior. Um, and then of course, you know, when we test, uh, like this video from our test site in California, um, we test the worst case. This is the worst case is all 16 coming back at the same time and the recovery system being down. So that you're, what you're seeing there is 16 zips waiting to land. Um, so another fun uh, detail I thought I'd show, this is our only use of computer vision today in operations, uh, is a pre-flight check. So this is a pre-flight. So before, to just explain what you're about to see, so you're seeing a wing. Uh, the wing has two control surfaces for fault tolerance, and we test thoroughly that we can fly the surface out. But of course, if, the, if a control surface fails in flight, the zip will automatically turn around and come home, not making the delivery. So to increase the chances the delivery goes through successfully, this is a little pre-flight check that we developed to, to make checking control services very uh, accurate and easy. Uh, and our operator UIs are refurbished iPhone SE. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is an iPhone being used as an angle measurement tool. Um, it'll play again because it happens pretty quickly. But as soon as the camera sees these fiducials, the, 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 wing will, uh, the plane will start moving its control services. And if, if everything looks good, the system will tell the operator, all right, these are good. Keep going on your pre-flight checks. Um, Anyway, again, we didn't start here, but these are things we've added over the last few years uh, to harden the things we, well, we, from experience, we know we need to make sure are really robust. Um, so if you haven't been near the equator, it rains. Uh, um, uh, I don't have a great video to show wind, but rain is actually easy compared to wind. And we can talk about that offline if you're interested, but let me show you So we do a lot of fun test rigs in California to basically that our systems will hold up in these crazy conditions. This is a this is a dynamic whiffle tree. If you're familiar with the whiffle tree, it distributes the load across a wing the way it's distributed in flight. And this one's doing it dynamically, so it's going up and down at three Gs, uh, basically, which is margin. 
in which case turbulent load. And this helps us know, like, do the wings break off? Does the battery latch fail? You know, and many other well, potential things that have been <laughs> shown to be vulnerable in this test. Uh, and this is an accelerated life model. And we have a bunch of testers like this that have battery hardware changes, you know, in a week uh, instead of, well, much longer. Uh, so to, as a part of the tour, uh, in California, we have a high volume test site where we've now done well over 100 flights in one day, full length flights to stay ahead of our operations. Uh, at our operations, our peak from one distribution center today is about, uh, I think our record is 67 flights in one day. Uh, we have a, our R&D site where we also can fly and we have a prototyping facility and a great view uh, and a manufacturing facility where we build everything. So the zips and the batteries, chargers, launcher, recovery system, and everything you need uh, when you go when you show up in a remote corner of the world to build a distribution center uh, for Zipline. So this is Rwanda. Um, we have two distribution centers operating in Rwanda today. Uh, the circles show are the service radius uh, of our distribution centers, are 80 kilometer radius. Uh, and then you're seeing all the hospitals and clinics that we are contracted to serve. We're not serving them all yet. We're currently scaling up to serve these. There's about 500 sites in Rwanda that. And today we're serving about uh, 67 or 70 of these sites in Rwanda. Uh, and earlier this year, we started operating in Ghana. So Ghana, we also have two distribution centers running now. Uh, we'll have one more in December and the fourth one in, Janu uh, in yeah, January, uh, hopefully, maybe February. Um, and so once, these are full, once we have all of these delivery sites online for these uh, two first customers, we'll be serving about 2,500 uh, delivery sites. Um, and to give you a sense of kind of scale of what this looks like in terms of how far we fly, so equator of the Earth, 40,000 kilometers, we do, it took the first time to do that, equivalent, took us six months. We currently do that every week. Um, and when we're serving all of those delivery sites, we should be doing that in about an hour, maybe hour and a half, uh, that, that much flying. Um, and when we think about that connected back to what we're trying to do as our mission, uh, our mission is to provide every human on Earth instant access to vital medical supplies. When we are fully scaled in Rwanda and Ghana, we're approaching basically 1% of this mission. We have a long way to go. Uh, and I mentioned that because I want to talk for a second about basically a big focus for us going forward. Uh, and that really is around big focus. And this is a big blocker for us scaling. Um, so this is how we deliver to, today. This is actually an old zip from video from two and a half years ago, but it's pretty much the same. The zip comes in, estimates the wind speed and direction, flying blind. Um, drops the package so it'll drift where the customer wants it. Um, and uh, this flying blind that we do today, and I'll talk for a second about how we fly blind, uh, as safe as we do today, but it's just not scalable, nor is it safe enough to scale. Uh, so I'll talk about that for, for a second here. Uh, I'll, I'll wait to this video end so you can see, um, this is slow-mo just to be clear. Some people ask me about that. Uh, uh, so this is this is one of the hospitals. It's actually the first hospital we started serving in Rwanda. This is a hospital compound. Serves a patient population of about half a million people and has about seven buildings uh, in the compound. Uh, and the video cuts there actually because at this compound, the groundskeepers catch the blood uh, and run into the clinic with the blood. And so I was well running after them. So the video gets a little choppy after this. Um, and yes, it does come close to hitting that car. So. People ask. Um, so, uh, so when we think about bringing on delivery sites, we basically break the problem into two parts. One is what we call the transit plan. So this is the plan to get from a zipline distribution center out to all these delivery sites. This is the transit plan for the first distribution center in Ghana today. Uh, it's this distribution center serving about 70 delivery sites today. Uh, and then the second part is basically the last step, which is from the transit plan to actually make the delivery. Uh, and it's a very simple thing we do. And so there's a little racetrack. Uh, the plane comes in. It has its delivery pass, and this is down. This is where we got the package. And during this pink segment is where it will dynamically compensate for the wind speed and direction. Uh, and we do the way we do this today. Again, not scalable at all. We do a drone survey, so quadcopters. <laughs> we support the drone industry a little bit. Uh, the rest of the drone industry a little bit. We use quadcopters to to build a 3D map model that we carefully double and triple check, and we manually. Uh, make this plan to not hit ground obstacles in the area. These are things like tall trees, cell towers, antennas. Those are the big things that we look out for, as well as terrain uh, to make sure that, well, we have that terrain. Uh, and so this is something that obviously the world is not static, and we assume it is right now, uh, and that's scary for us. 
And as we bring on more and more delivery sites, like this is slow and expensive. And as you can imagine, our customers are not rich in the world. They're quite poor. And we have to be very cost sensitive in everything we do. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we have a big focus going forward. And basically, how do we do this at scale? How do we know when we're coming to make the delivery? We're not going to hit anything. Uh, we're, we're, we're dropping where the customer actually wants it. Um, and of course, trying to do that on demand. Um, so uh, this is a big challenge for the future of what we're working on. And one of the reasons I've actually been out to Zurich, for those of you who don't know my background, I spent a lot of time out here back getting Ross off the ground many years ago. Uh, and so I have a huge amount of respect for the universities uh, yeah, sort of within uh, uh, 100 kilometers of here uh, of, you know, for, for autonomy and perception. Uh, and this is really our future challenge for Zipline. We can, there's no way we can scale doing uh, to what we need to scale and do it safely, doing it the way we do today. Uh, so we've got to find a better way. And uh, so I'll leave you with that, thinking about that challenge. Uh, and that's your quick orientation to Zipline. So thank you. Good. So we have a little history here uh, representing the Zurich computer vision history on drones a bit. Uh, and then also a bit of future, future looking uh, one or two last videos where we show what we're doing at Atarian on that front. Um, computer vision on drones, my name is Lawrence Meyer. <coughs> I did a PhD starting uh, around uh, 2012, so long ago I forgot. Um, but I started to work on computer vision on drones 2008 as a uh, master's student at ETH. I've open sourced a lot of my work, um, starting with onboard computer vision at the Pixar project, which I founded. Uh, and then there was this slight detour because we didn't have an autopilot for our computer vision system, so I quickly created one over five years. <laughs> um, and that's where all of these Pixar open hardware, Mavlink, ground control, PX4, open source software is coming from as an enabler for that, and maybe it required that mindset to open source everything, because otherwise you think it's so valuable, you just sit on it. Um, so that's good. And now, uh, 10 years later, we're finally doing what I set out as student to do. So that's really awesome. Um, I also love to show this video, because it shows the drone is on the top left. Um, that the fascination for these flying vehicles <laughs> is not even limited to engineers. It's actually something that is quite ubiquitous. Uh, yeah, we, we need to try that on more cows, uh, so I have a new video. So 10 years ago, how did computer vision on drones look 10 years ago? Um, quite interesting. I mean, what, what do you do if your compute is limited but you have paper. Well, you instrument your environment. So it's not actually reading these tags, it's actually using the tag positions to triangulate. So get, you get a full 3D pose and velocity. And this is also already using visual inertial fusion in a very crude way. So we rejected incorrect readings of the vision system by using the attitude of the vehicle because apparently that's a fixed transformation. Um, yeah, and it's also not flying over that pattern in a fixed way. It's actually the waypoints that are roughly over the pattern uh, because apparently otherwise we would lose position loss. So it's, it's quite funny. Um, and then if you look really, really carefully, this guy on the top left there is wearing glo gloves, and there's no reason he's wearing gloves. <laughs> yeah, so that was this, at a student competition, and the task was to fly a figure eight. And it works, it's fully autonomous. Uh, the way we do takeoff and landing back in the day was open loop because you don't see anything. Uh, but that works. So, yeah, let me, let me wait for the landing. It should happen any minute now. I hope it doesn't take another circle. We don't have time for that. Okay, we'll skip over that. So, nine years ago, one year later, um, this is what we did. And um, 
you will see we took safety very um, carefully uh, here. So this leash here is not under tension, but that's how you fly uh, downtown Zurich anonymously. And what we did here was following the wall and then 3D reconstructing it. Again, very much MVP. Um, everything is pretty crude. What's interesting though is the architecture of the system hasn't really changed. Um, even current commercial models of drones use a very similar architecture. Uh, luckily, they, they can do more advanced stuff today though. Good. So that was that part, really the first attempt. And then this is my preferred video. Um, you can walk a human with a drone. <laughs> so what it's doing here is it's building a occupancy map of the environment. It identifies frontiers, the blue and green line, and explores the frontiers with the only goal to maximize knowledge about the environment. That's a very scary goal because if machines truly become autonomous and repair themselves, it would just mean they would like go completely crazy and try to cover the whole world. Um, it's not crashing into obstacles because it's uh, detecting them like this pole over here and then it navigates around them. So again, not super sophisticated by today's standards, but a decade ago, that was actually pretty advanced and we were, we were one of the first research teams that actually ran everything on board. And we built, we built our own onboard computer, which we then sold to uh, groups at Stanford, MIT, UPenn. Um, so uh, the Skydio guys actually used it. So back in the day, yes. And I love when we can accelerate the video, it just gets better. Yeah, so apparently it also works indoors. There's no GPS. Um, the whole positioning was based on optical flow and nothing in there. Cool. So we jumped forward a bit three years ago. Um, yep. So that's actually the end of my PhD. I'm particularly proud of it. And it's a problem the industry hasn't solved yet. So this is a video of a DJI Phantom 4 with their stereo obstacle avoidance system flying over a lake. Uh, it's going all well, no problem. And then if you look closer, you wonder like, what is that? Well, those are power lines. And what else do we observe? Well, they're on the horizon and they're perfectly level. And that is a problem you cannot solve with a single stereo camera. So what I did is I took the depth map of a pair that's ori oriented horizontally and a pair that's oriented, that's a confidence map you get out of that. So it actually tells you it's not very confident around here. And then I took a pair of a, of a vertical and fused them. So left is the horizontal pair, which tells you that something is not quite right here around that area of the bridge. Right is the vertical pair which has a really good reading on that section of the bridge. And then if you fuse the confidence maps, you end up with the center image and the center confidence map for Syria. And uh, that way you actually can solve for power lines effectively. And that's of course expensive computation. So we ran that on an FPGA and with, with an FPGA system. So that overall gets you then real-time. This is actually real-time captured from the system. This is just screen captured from Arbis, as you can see. Um, and this is the center occupancy map you get. And so you have no artifacts there. These are power lines. The normal stereo pair really can't see them well. You have really clean result against the background. And then for the vertical poles, you start to have issues here um, in the same way that are not present in the fused result. So that's something the industry still needs to solve. Yeah, same thing on, on normal images. Um, based on my previous experience, I'm expecting it to take another four years uh, until we see that. Um, 
then these are some results from colleagues at ETH where um, they worked on VIO. So again, that was three years ago, uh, exciting and new back then. Now it's more commonplace. You can buy sensors that have it, have it inbuilt. And then two years ago, we're starting to get closer to the end application in uh, drones. So that is again, something that is not in the industry yet. Um, risk-based planning, interesting toy uh, city. And essentially, the way we're minimizing risk is by looking at coverage or occupancy of certain hate profiles. And that allows you to optimize your flight altitude for a multi-copter for risk. And it also allows you to optimize you uh, for energy usage. So these are different algorithms. And then you also, we also apply the smoothness constraint with my student William Moore, and then you see the green path is what you get compared to a manual flight of a human. Now, how does that look? Uh, left is the drone, right is the occupancy map, what it sees, that's the mission, the pink line. And you can see as it uh, explores the environment, after it has the first blockage, it gains altitude, doesn't go back down or anything. Um, but it's also optimizing for energy. So the naive solution in this scene would be to actually go above everything um, because then you know you're clear, but you're wasting energy. So what the system does is it optimizes because it doesn't know yet their buildings. It first tries to go around it, uh, which happens now. And then it sees, oh, that's block two. So try the other direction. And no, nope, doesn't work. Good. Um, and then it returns around that path, which is successful. If that wouldn't have worked either, it would have escaped way altitude. So that's an optimization level that I haven't seen in uh, systems yet, except for the ones in Skydio. So I think the, the overall industry still has there some work to do. And we're contributing with open source implementations of this particular algorithm with Altarian. Cool. Now, closing in, um, other things we've done whenever you have jammed GPS or other issues, um, we have brought VIO to PX4 as a tightly integrated system into the whole uh, state estimation framework. Altarian is very actively contributing there still, um, improving it. That, that, was, that was the first result we've, in, we've integrated since two more VAO pipelines, and you have no GPS receiver on this, or no active receiver on this unit, so you can see it actually is capable of flying quite accurately, and also able to fly at higher altitudes. You're not constrained to the ground or anything. And that's really helpful to deal with, yeah, with GPS outages and gives you an alternative mode. And then today, what we're starting to do um, is to bring that really into the full loop. So that's the full integration on Altarian Enterprise PX4, which includes the flight computer and not just the flight comp controller. So what you see here is a mission, plan, takeoff, OK, plan to the tree. It avoids the obstacle um, at, the, at the shortest path possible, also on the way back. And that's all fully automatic and in closed loop with the flight controller. So it's not going into weird offboard mode or anything. It just stays on the mission and tries to follow it. So we're bringing what you've seen in that decade old journey now really into the open source space and into products. Cool. And that's a good reason to thank all the contributors in the PX4 community. Um, I think we don't need to look at architecture today quick screen of all the cool products that use PX4 today. Eventually everybody is there. You know? So and then I can't leave the room until the and the and the cool and the cool thing is that we're picking up complexity with all this new functionality at an exponential speed, but we're also picking up contributors at an exponential speed. 
Uh, and uh, today, 2019, we will end up at around 750. So we've, again, added quite a few contributors on top of this stuff, which is important. Cool. And I wanted to use that one opportunity to thank my uh, professor at ETH, Professor Mark Paulface, uh, and his computer vision and geometry lab, because that lab has a very open source centric, supportive uh, attitude. Most academia, most in academia does, but it, it kind of prioritized doing the right thing for a community over cranking out yet another startup, um, which in fails. So that's really good. And uh, well, it still generated a very successful startup. Cool. Thanks. If you want to contribute, uh, there is a computer vision page on the PX4 website. And uh, yeah, you can engage with our developers here. Thank you.